Extensive kelp forests line the west coast of North America. The abundant food and safe passage provided by these forests enabled tribal ancestors to migrate by boat thousands of years ago and settle the Americas. This ancient migration route is sometimes called the Kelp Highway. But kelp forests are much more than a highway. They are lifeways. They are a fundamental part of tribal culture and an underpinning of our coastal communities today. Following substantial declines of kelp forests, Puget Sound Restoration Fund launched an eight-day kelp expedition in July 2021. Over 40 partners surveyed kelp forests from Freshwater Bay in the Strait of Juan de Fuca to Squaxin Island in the southernmost portion of Puget Sound. Scientists on boats, kayaks, and paddle boards mapped kelp on the surface, collected samples, and deployed drones and other equipment. Scuba divers conducted underwater ecological surveys. Community gatherings co-hosted with tribes along the way featured foods made possible by kelp forests. Today we had wonderful food here with the kelp and halibut salad and the wonderful oysters, the wonderful salmon. This big collaborative sharing of knowledge is essential to protecting kelp forests that are vital to our way of life. Important work lies ahead to ensure thriving kelp forests that continue to support local abundance. The expedition was organized to spur these efforts, build partnerships, and inspire collective action. Kelp is just this impossibly beautiful, magical plant that grows along the shore. Kelp forests skirt the contours of shores where there is high energy, wave exposure, cold water, nutrients aplenty to support that growth. And so you've got a hold fast on the bottom attaching to rocks and then this beautiful long stipe or stem that reaches to the surface and has a floating bulb on the top that keeps it buoyant at the surface. And then you've got blades, beautiful glistening iridescent blades that grow out from the bulb. That's where it's anchored. That's where it grows, but that is not the only place where it influences the ecosystem and touches us. Because all of that plant material, that biomass that grows in those places where conditions are right, the kelp starts to break down, particles break off, and those particles then become part of crabs scavenging on the bottom. They become part of the filter feeders that are pulling that material out of the water column. And those big long stipes, those whips, become part of the shore. Kelp is being thrown up onto the shore, those ropey masses, where it starts to decompose and become part of the terrestrial food systems. So it's not even limited in terms of being part of the marine ecosystem. It gets around in all the foods we eat. It gets around in all the species that we care about. And therefore, it is supporting us, not just in a single way, but in many ways, through all the different habitats, species, foods that define this place. The word kelp means a very particular group of brown algae. There are seaweeds. These are uh, plants that grow in the marine environment that are big. You can see they photosynthesize, take up carbon dioxide and produce oxygen and so forth. There are three main groups of seaweeds. You can go down here and find them. There's ones that are red algae, there are green algae, things like sea lettuce, and then there are the brown algae. Within the brown algae, there is a group called the kelp. In Washington State, we are very fortunate to have one of the most biodiverse kelp communities in the world. We have more than 22 species of kelp. 
I'm a marine ecologist and I study uh, bull kelp forests and also eelgrass throughout Puget Sound. These habitats are crucially important to support most of the animals and fish and birds that we see and love around us. So for instance, many people may not know about kelp, but they find out that they actually deeply care about kelp when they understand that kelp provides critical habitat for many invertebrates, but also forage fish, salmon, and orca. And so the importance of kelp really magnifies up through the food web. But to understand kelp better, the species that we look at in particular is bull kelp because you can see it from the surface, the canopy floats on the surface. We believe the kelp communities have been more stable near the ocean and in the Strait of Juan de Fuca where we are now and here at Smith Island. And we're really concerned about broad losses as we move into Puget Sound where the water is naturally warmer which is harder for kelp, and there are also many more people and the impacts that people bring. This is Wing Point on Bainbridge Island. And Wing Point is a really uh, sad story for us because Wing Point is where the last huge persistent bull kelp bed existed on Bainbridge Island. And as you can see, there's no bull kelp here. It disappeared around 2017. Decades ago, bull kelp ringed many of the different sides of Bainbridge Island. What we've watched over the last decades is the contraction of bull kelp and its disappearance from different parts of shoreline. One of the things that we as researchers are focused on is how is the kelp resource doing in Washington State. And it's important to DNR because uh, DNR is the steward of this resource for the citizens of Washington. I grew up out here fishing as a little tiny boy and, and I still do practice my sovereign right as a tribal member and a tribal fisherman, but it's very detrimental to the loss of kelp and what we see going on here today in 2021. My dad would always make me stay a mile off of uh, off the shore because this was nothing but kelp beds all the way to Shilsho. Uh, I fished with my folks out here back in the late 70s, early 80s. To my recollection, there was feeder fish hopping and bouncing everywhere around here. I learned at a young age about the kelp and all of the habitat that it created for our fingerlings and our babies and for future generations of fishermen and future generations of salmon people. The highway of kelp and that social fabric, not just for our salmon people, but for us human beings as well. And for our relatives up and down the coast, up and down the shoreline, how important that was to each and every one of our villages for existence. It created food systems, it created trade systems. It's our ancestral economy. It's something that uh, has given us life for thousands of years and hundreds of generations. The king salmon, Chinook, it's uh, my favorite fish to catch. It's, it's the largest fish, great table fare, and you can catch big Chinook out in the ocean you can be in 200 feet of water, have you down riggers, down 100 feet, but there's nothing like catching Chinook next to a kelp bed in 30 feet of water. And it's just so magical to be able to troll right along the kelp bed and catch 20, 30 pound Chinook. My biggest is a 42 pound Chinook that I caught along the kelp bed. You can still try to use your equipment and hone in and find a bait ball, but when you're buzzing along and trolling along kelp line, there's always uh, fish along the kelp. With bait fish gotta eat too, right? The kelp forest is their banquet table, and they're gonna be able to come in here and find all different types of food to eat. They're gonna be able to find even shelter from predators like Chinook. One thing that we as legislators and politicians get caught up in is the excitement of saving the charismatic species. So there's a lot of support among the public for saving the killer whale, or saving orca whales, saving salmon. But in order to do that, we have to know how to take care of the details that the orca whales are depending on. So things like how do we restore and save kelp beds? How do we restore shellfish beds? How do we restore the salmon and the forage all of those details go into protecting the ecosystem that the orca whale needs. The second part, and the part that I'm finding really intriguing now, is the food web aspect of this thing. Who eats who? And I always get into this whole thing about follow the carbon. 
where does the productivity of this kelp, which is enormous, where does it go in the food web? And it turns out it's going all over everywhere and in ways that people are just beginning to figure out. You go out here and pigeon guillemots are what, 15% kelp carbon. These rockfish they're talking about are 50% of the carbon in those things came from kelp. That always is a this eye opener for people to think about. If you took away that source, if you took away the kelp, what happens? Well, you lose the habitat, yes. But then you have to start having things starving. And so the food web part of this thing is, is really important. And this kelp washes up on the beach here, right? It washes up in the rack line here. There are all these little amphipods and everything. Who eats the amphipods? The shorebirds. Raccoons come down and forage on the beach and eat these things, you know. So all this kelp carbon isn't just in the marine environment, it's in the birds, it's in the terrestrial environment. It gets around. Kelp carbon gets around. And that to me is the really funny story. That the food web and the, who's connected here is the, the connectivity of the food. Who eats who? You are what you eat. You and I are 30% corn carbon. And I'm trying to figure out how much of us are kelp carbon. One of the activities is part of our index site monitoring where we're trying to capture the invertebrates, fishes, and algae that are associated with bull kelp forests at several different sites throughout Puget Sound and beyond. And the other activity that's taking place is that we're checking in and monitoring the kelp outplant, the enhancement that Puget Sound Restoration Fund started this past winter. And so those plants are now on the surface and we come out every couple of weeks to do different growth measurements and to figure out how well they're doing relatively with respect to grazers or weather damage. Our kelp beds certainly persist longer in the straits and in the islands and the places that they have good, good anchoring, good purchase. The kelp will persist here in Puget Sound until August, uh, September, and then it's virtually done. In fact, uh, it has probably ended in terms of production of, of spores at some point in July. So that's a very short season where our Puget Sound Central Basin and Southern Basin kelps are producing spores to inoculate the ground for the next group of annuals the following year. As opposed to the rest of uh, straits in the straits and the islands that where they're, they have kelps that will persist right through the winter time. And it's raining down new spores all the time. That is a very big difference between these two places. And yet we still have bull kelp that persists in many small pockets around in the central and southern basin. We are out here today specifically looking for young of year rockfish. There's a few species of rockfish in Puget Sound that are on the endangered species list and so we're really interested in learning more about how the new young of year use kelp habitats and eelgrass habitats here in Puget Sound and we've been collecting them we use some of their tissue to analyze their uh, stable isotopes, and so that gives us a lot of information about what types of carbon are at the base of their food web that these little guys are eating. Is it based on kelp habitats? Is it based on eelgrass habitats? Is it based on pelagic habitats? Um, and then also using their little ear bones where they lay down daily growth increments and we can kind of see how much they're growing in these different habitats as well. So we are really trying to understand how important kelp beds are versus eelgrass beds versus the, the pelagic environment to these young of year rockfish in, in Puget Sound. Culturally speaking, kelp had many uses and this is where I'm very proud of that strong and cleverness name uh, which our ancestors called ourselves. When they found a resource, whether it was from the lands or from the seas, or from the skies even, they found that there were ways that we could use it. And there was all sorts of ways to use it, multiple ways. And so for kelp in particular, we used it mostly as a cooking tool and a fishing tool. Other ways that we used it was for building ropes, especially when we had our own fishing nets. So we used that when we were going out in the canoe or when we were building nets for even catching ducks. We actually used um, nets high in the air to catch our birds for our meat. Other ways, and I like to bring in the little daily humor for kelp uses, we used it a lot to throw it at each other. <laughs> so we've had a lot of great uses for kelp. We've always used it through the generations, and I think that's just always going to continue. It's in our blood, and I'm sure it's in your blood as well. And so 
We find it very important at Statistischen Nuskayim that if we're going to have any efforts to keep our treaty rights and our natural resources going for generations to come, we have to work on every resource, and kelp is included, and it's so unique, isn't it? It's so unique. Um, so even more reason to keep all of that good work going so that all of this can stay. I'd like to welcome you to our homelands. You know, bed used to come way out here. You know, we'd have to come, you know, when I was fishing as a kid, we had to come at least 300 yards out here, you know, to, to pass this kelp bed and, you'd, you know, go halfway down the southern end of the island. Uh, I appreciate you coming and doing your research to figure out what's going on. Kelp has brought more people together in a more healthy way than I think I've seen with any other resource. I've been around for 40 some odd years. Salmon, contentious. Shellfish, contentious. You know, eelgrass didn't really get people too excited. This thing, all of a sudden, everybody going, whoa, you know, and not in a contentious way, but in a caring way. That plus, I think, global warming, everybody began to go, whoa, this is real. This is something we need to all get together, get together. So I hope you feel proud of the work that you're doing and the partnerships that you're forming because I am certainly proud of that work and I'm very grateful for it. All of our ancestors and the work that they did seven generations ago brings us here right now and forming partnerships and doing work that's really, really good and really, really sacred. Whoa.